I want to win that fight in the ground, in the standing. I want to win. I want to, you know, prove to myself 10 times is more than I want to prove to the fan that I can beat Olaski. Of course, I have a game plan, but when the bell fight starting, I'm doing everything for my victory. Yeah, he's bigger. You know, yeah, he gets the muscles, but I've been dropping those guys for eight years. He's just another one on my platter. I think Elvis feels comfortable with the role of underdog. I think he kind of wants to be the underdog um, for whatever reasons, and he's pretty good at it. So uh, if I'm the favorite going into this fight, I want to see if I can change his luck as far as being the spoiler. I'll be honest, I, you know, I, I think I'm the underdog here, and I think the majority of the people out there think I'm the underdog. And it just takes a lot of pressure off. Elvis Sinisic is known as a great submission and ground fighter. I'm not really known for that, but it doesn't mean I can't, you know, fight on the ground. And as far as how well I fight on the ground, we'll find that out later tonight. And it doesn't matter whether I'm on top or underneath, I'm dangerous. And uh, hopefully Forrest knows that, because if he doesn't, he'll be in for a surprise. Sometimes it takes more than brawn, and Ron Faircloth claims he's got more heart than anyone. Ron Ronzilla Faircloth is a very experienced fighter who trains with UFC veteran Dave Strasser. Faircloth likes to dish out punishment and is more than willing to take his fair share. Faircloth favors beating his opponents into submission on the ground, and he hopes this strategy will carry him to victory in his first UFC. I'm going to take him down. I'm going to wear him out. I'm going to pound on him. I know I hit harder, I know I hit more, and I know I can take it. He's not going to break me. Alessio Legionaria Sakara is an Italian boxer who recently held the IBF Junior World Championship. Though Sakara is deadly with his hands, he has trained extensively in wrestling and Brazilian jiu-jitsu to become a complete fighter and looks to impress in his UFC debut. Coming up next, Ron Ronzilla Faircloth takes on Alessio Legionaria Sakara. Well, time now for the tale of the tape, brought to you by Science. Science Extreme Supplements, available at GNC stores nationwide. Sakara 24, Faircloth with more experience at the age of 34. 6-0, height advantage for Sakara, and a two and a half inch reach advantage. Joe, let's take a look at these resumes. Both are making their UFC debut. How much are nerves gonna play a part in this? Yeah, it all depends on the fighter. Both these guys are mixed martial arts veterans. They have a lot of experience in the cage, but you know what? This is the big show. Whenever you're in the big show, there's always butterflies. Let's see who reacts to it better. You ready to fight? You ready? Sakara, as the boxer, you would assume, wants to stay on his feet. Sakara pressing forward with a jab. Okay, right away, Sakara looks to have the much better strikes. He looks like his stance is better, he looks more comfortable. 
Sakara backing Faircloth up, definitely the aggressor. Ron Faircloth up against the cage, and there Jason you can see punches. Sakara coming in with a few knees. Ron Faircloth is in danger of being stopped. He's a free Dean's giving him a chance. Well, very close to being stopped right there. Sakara choosing to stay with his fists. Herb Dean was just about to jump in, and Ron Faircloth managed to do just enough to convince him otherwise. Four minutes left in round number one, and early on, a definite advantage for Alessio Sakara. Sakara is definitely the superior striker. Now let's see what Ron Faircloth has off his back. Oh, big punches. Faircloth doing his best to tie him up. Yeah, he's gonna have to do more than that. He's gonna have to offer something offensively off his back to keep Sakara from just smashing down on him like this. I mean, hammer fists, punches, elbows. I mean, Faircloth is a tough guy, but he does not want to absorb all this punishment. And Faircloth talked about how he wanted to be the one that did the ground and pound, but the roles have definitely reversed, haven't they? Looks like it. And you know, Faircloth doesn't seem to be offering anything off his back. He's just taking shots. He might be rocked from the previous exchange on their feet. Two minutes gone by in round number one. This is scheduled three rounder. You know what, if he doesn't offer anything offensively, I can see Herb Dean stopping his fight. It has been all legionarious up to this point. Sakara in guard, but it doesn't seem to be doing anything. He is punching at will. Yeah, Ron Faircloth is, is, is not holding on to Sakara's upper body. He's not controlling him. He's not keeping him from raising up. He's not uh, raising his guard up to try to lock the shoulders down and do something to keep him from, from uh, getting a posture and then dropping down punches and elbows. I mean, he's throwing little punches off his back, but they're not, they're not doing anything. He's taking some bombs. I mean, he's a tough guy. He's basically just absorbing them. How long can he continue to take this beating? Herb Dean looks concerned. He's, he's not in enough trouble for him to stop it, though. He's definitely taking a beating, but it doesn't look dangerous yet. Shot to the body, the first one we've really seen. The rest have gone to the head of Ron Faircloth. <laughs> to the body and to the head by Sakara. Good elbows and tight. Oh man, that might be it. We've seen him still have nothing to stop this. This is bottom man, you need to find that. Looking like he's taking a page out of David Wazo's book with those elbows. You know, Faircloth is just absorbing it. He's a tough guy. You know, I mean, he just took about 30 unanswered shots to the head. And it doesn't seem to have even phased him. Well, Faircloth has told us that he's not known for anything besides really his heart. Not for his skill, not for his talent, just his heart showing huge heart right now. That's not an enviable position. These guys who are known just for their heart don't usually end up so good at the end. Winding down round number one, a little over 30 seconds left. Sakara, what he needs to do to really end this fight is get out of this position. He's in the guard position and he can drop punches and elbows, but he can't get proper leverage. He needs to get from this position past the guard and get to a more dominant position, whether it's side control or the mount, where he can do some real damage. And where Faircloth can't offer up anything defensive. Last seconds ticking away of round number one. It looks as though we will go to two. And that is it. Without a doubt, Sakara, the victor of that round. Let's take a look at the replay. Here you see some devastating punches by Sakara. Ron Faircloth basically just covering him up and absorbing, just missed that knee. Just eating right hand, left hook, 
Herb, Herb Dean was just, I mean, he literally touched Ron's back and just decided to change his mind. Now here's these hammer fists just coming down over and over again. And Faircloth just absorbs them. More elbows right there shows you the devastating force of Legionarius. He's basically throwing those with his arm, though. I mean, look at the difference between the way he throws those and the way David Loazzo throws them. Loazzo whips his whole body into him, and he slashes down with the point of the elbow and just cuts guys wide open. Believe me, if Loazzo hit you with that many elbows, out, you're going out. to the hospital right now. Out, guys. Well, Loazzo, of course, and Evan Tanner went out it. Evan Tanner, the worst for wear. Yeah, Loazzo's elbows are just on another level. Roma. Yes. Ready. Ron Ready. Faircloth trying to loosen something up. Yeah, he might have hurt his shoulder or something. Yeah. We go to round two. Good Wait. leg kick, Stop. but whoop, Stop. a little low. Stop. Stop. Oh, Sakara gets it in the jewels. And we will see. Right to the olive branch. How long it takes for him Bang, to right in there, baby. That's pinpoint accuracy. That's it. Well, we said Ron Faircloth nice. was only known for his heart. Yes. Maybe he is known for his accuracy as well, but he says, my bad. And Sakara's Italian, so you know that's a big target. Sakara will have as much time as he needs to come back. Oh, man, he's hurt. He is hurting bad. This, this might be the end of the fight. He's writhing in pain. I, I mean, this isn't, let's take a look at the replay again. I mean, that was just on the button. Bang, right to the jewels. And I've been there before, ladies and gentlemen, that's no fun. Especially, sometimes it's even worse when you're wearing a cup because the cup slams right into the nuts. Or what? testicles is the uh, technical term for them. Is Correct. Well, if you can put a 205-pound man to his knees that fast, you know it's caused a bit of pain. You know, and clearly it was an accident. You see immediately Ron Faircloth puts his hands up apologetically. It could either be a no contest. Oh, look at everybody. Randy Couture in the house. Everybody loves that guy. Without a doubt. And for good reason. The natural. That's that it. it. They're stopping the fight. Herb Dean stopping the fight. Get back, though, to what you were saying, Joe, about how this will be scored and, and awarded. You know what? It all depends, I think, on uh, whether or not Herb Dean rules it intentional or unintentional. We're going to have to wait until Bruce Buffer's announcement until we figure out exactly how this is going to go down in the record books. But to the fans, obviously, it goes down as a disappointment. Sakara was doing great. He looked fantastic. Looked like he was on his way to an easy victory and caught one in the jewels. And what, what's one amazing, more time, too. Let's take a look at that replay. I mean, obviously, he's not faking it. This is exactly pinpoint on the button. And Sakara instantly crumples to his knees. That's just pain. I mean, if you can get a guy who's that tough to fold up and, and cry like a little girl, <laughs> you know he got him on the button. <laughs> Bang. He, he is Ow. still on the ground, Joe. Yeah, he might have ruptured a testicle. I mean, anything could have happened here. Like I said, sometimes it's worse with the cup because if you're in a position where you're moving funny, that cup could slam right into the testicles and rupture one of them. And it's a hard cup. Going right into the testicles, nowhere to move. He's, he can't even walk, man. That, that guy's hurting bad. Wow. Alessio Sakara, let's get it to Bruce Buffer for the decision. Ladies and gentlemen, due to an injury to Alessio Sakara at 10 seconds of the second round, on the doctor's advice, referee Herb Dean has called a stop to this fight, declaring this fight a no contest. Our next match is a classic example of why mixed martial arts is so popular. Two unique fighters, two unique styles. Only one will earn bragging rights tonight. Japan's Keigo Kunihara is a judo stylist who excels at slams and takedowns. Even though Kunihara's opponent is a Brazilian jiu-jitsu expert, he feels comfortable on the mat and hopes to do damage with a high-impact throw on the way to the ground. 
Marcio Petapano Cruz is a six-time world jiu-jitsu champion and eight-time Pan American jiu-jitsu champion and the 2003 Abu Dhabi over 99 kilogram champion, a master grappler. Tonight, Petapano makes not only his UFC debut, but his MMA debut as well. Coming up next, Japan's Keigo Kunihara takes on Marcio Petapano Cruz. Let's look at the tail of the tape, brought to you by Science. Science Extreme Supplements, available at GNC stores nationwide. Marcio Cruz, 27 years of age, Kunohara, 30. A height advantage of four inches for Cruz and an astronomical eight-inch reach difference. When the action begins, our referee in charge of this contest is Big John McCarthy. Kunihara against Cruz. Which style will end up being the better this evening? The question is, Joe, and we've talked about this for a few days, for Kunihara, do you throw a guy to the ground who All wants right, to be go, on the ground? Yeah, you that's, that is true. You and ready? you know, Let's the other thing we were talking about, reach advantage. There is a reach advantage for Cruz, but he's not really a striker, so I don't know if that even comes to play because he wants to be on top of Kunihara. I mean, you can see right away, he's is striking, his stance is a little goofy. His, right away, he takes him to the ground. He's in guard. And Pei Depano's on his back. Pei Depano looks as calm as a cucumber. He just isn't even phased. You know what, it's uh, it's within his best interest to act pretty quickly before uh, Kunihara on, gotta work, uh, starts gotta work. to get sweaty. Let's go and becomes slippery and gets harder to control. Like again, we said, uh, Pei Depano is used to uh, competing in gi competitions. I mean, he has competed in Abu Dhabi, going for Noma Plata. He's got a hold of that arm. I mean, he's got an incredible grip. He's Trying to a... get that arm lock. Kinohara holds it off, goes away. Kunihara avoids an early clinch. This might be the worst striking we've ever seen in the UFC. I mean, you see Pei Depano right away. I mean, he looks like he just started striking yesterday. This is his mixed martial arts debut, and again, he is a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu legend. When you say legend, that is for sure. He's won the world championships in Jiu-Jitsu six different times eight-time Pan American Jiu-Jitsu champion. Kunahara goes to the sweep, or the takedown rather, but is blocked by Cruz. Tries again, and he's down. That was really telegraphed. I'm surprised that landed. I'm surprised he got that off. Pei Depano is on his back. Kunahara's in side control. Pei Depano gets a hold of his leg, drags him into the half guard. Now he's gonna look to stuff his leg back and get him in a full guard, and he did that. Now he's got one butterfly hook in, one overhook with his right leg, and I'm gonna look probably for Pei Depano to sweep. He's either gonna try to sweep or he's gonna try to isolate an arm. He's got long legs, he's got a good guard, but again, like we said before, this is a guy who's primarily, his, uh, his background is in fighting with the gi. Come on, gotta work. Kunahara able to get Pei Depano on the mat, on his back twice already in this first round. Trying to capitalize. He's gonna work, let go of the fence. Up against the fence. As we wind into three minutes gone in this first round. Now Pei Depano's gotta do something here. He, uh, he can't let this guy just press him up against the fence and uh, hit him with these little punches because he will lose his turn. He's got to sweep him, he's got to try to go for submission, he's got to do something. The good news for him is Kunahari isn't a devastating striker. He's not a great submission guy, he's a judo guy. The audience is starting to get bored. Hey, Depano. Figuring out what he can and can't do He's against Kunahara. That's right a little weird play. Big John McCarthy decides to stand up. Very good call with Big John McCarthy. The problem is standing him up and neither one of these guys are strikers. I mean, 
mean, this is playground striking 101. Oh, connecting right, right there. Right hand. I mean, pedipano has got the perfect body for a striker. He's tall, long limbs. He just doesn't have enough experience in it. And that should come with time, shouldn't it? Uh, it should come with training, you know, but, you know, realistically, this is his octagon debut. He probably should have already done that. He tries to drag Kunahara down to the ground, unsuccessful. Kunahara is showing some really good base, and Pei DePano is content with being on his back, but he's not doing anything. He's on his back, he's got double underhooks and butterfly. I mean, the only thing that's here is a sweep. Okay, now he's in a half guard. There's some sweeps. Is he in a half guard or is he? No, okay. His legs are so long, it looks like he's in a half guard. Let's go, let's he's got work. one butterfly hook in. Get it going. And uh, the left leg is over. Look at like he's trying to sweep it, but Kunahara has some really great base. Kunahara back to his feet. On his feet once again as we wind down round number one. I would just like to say right now that Eddie Bravo called this. He thought that this is exactly how this fight was going to go down. Kunahara, the aggressor, it seemed, in round number one. I mean, if this was a gi jiu-jitsu match, Kunahara would already be unconscious. But it is not. Let's take a look at the replay. Beautiful hip toss in this first round. And this is, this is core strength right here. You look at him, he gets that left underhook and just swings his body over and bang! And you can see the surprised look on Cruz's face. Now here's the right hand by Cruz, but I mean, look at the way he threw that. His head was back, his chin was up, his weight was leaning back. I mean, it's like he was throwing the punch and worried about being hit at the same time. I mean, you can tell, this looks like a guy who's just started striking. And again, this is no insult to him, he's a jiu-jitsu legend, it's just... This is mixed martial arts. It's a completely different game. We get set for round number two. I mean, you remember when Michael Jordan started playing baseball? <laughs> I remember well. Holla. <laughs> As do millions of other baseball fans around the world. I'm sure Michael would like us, everybody to forget. Well, Pei Depano can forget about that first round. Time to you move ready? on. You ready? Back up. I would like to forget about it. Back up, back up. Can we, we go, skip to the third go, round? We might have to. <laughs> I mean, I just don't know where this could possibly head. This is, uh, you're going to see more of the same. This is an unfortunate pairing. You hear his coach yelling, use your hands to Kunohara. But, you know, Kunohara is, uh, he's no Jerome LeBanner either. Couple body shots. Really, no force behind it. And he gets with a throw. Kunahara's got some excellent throws. Guillotine! No, slip right out of it. You know, it's very hard to catch Pei Depano. And now they're both very slippery, so it's going to be even harder to catch somebody. Pei Depano's on top, though. This is much better for him. Pass, nice. He's inside control. Kunahara's up. He's got his back. And now the over under. Now we might see something. He's got the rear He's got it. He's sticking his tongue out. He knows it's over. Tap. There's Very it. nice. It is all over in the second round. Beautiful transition. He went from the over-under a la Marcelo Garcia, spun around to the back, got the hooks in, and put it out. Kunahara looked in control, Joe, early, but what a great move, as you said. Let's take a look at the replay. Kunahara makes the mistake of letting Pei DePano get an overhook and an underhook. Overhook with the right, underhook with the left. Spins around to the back, gets the right hook in. Kunohara steps up, left hook goes in. Locks it on, he sticks his tongue out because he knows it's over. Let's send it to Bruce Buffer for the decision. Ladies and gentlemen, at one minute, two seconds of round number two, referee John McCarthy has called a stop to this contest due to a tap out from a rear naked choke. Declaring the winner, Marcio Pedapano Jorge Rivera wants to send a message and will stop at nothing once he senses an opening, while after a career of cutting weight, Dennis Hallman's energy is back. 
Dennis Superman Hallman is one of the most experienced and dangerous fighters in MMA. This will be Hallman's 70th pro MMA fight, and he is the only man to ever defeat current UFC welterweight champion Matt Hughes twice, submitting him both times in under a minute. Hallman had UFC fights in the lightweight and welterweight categories, and tonight he makes his UFC middleweight debut. When the fight begins, I picture myself walking across the ring, um, engaging Jorge and taking the fight to the ground. Jorge El Conquistador Rivera is a hard-nosed striker who likes to move forward and keep the pressure on his opponents. He has become well-known for his punishing clinch game. While striking is the Puerto Rican fighter's strong point, he feels he has all of the tools to become a top contender in the middleweight division. I see him working his submissions, takedown submissions. I don't see him standing up with me at all. And if he does, then I think he'll suffer the consequences of that. Coming up next, Dennis Superman Holman takes on Jorge El Conquistador Rivera. Time now for the tale of the tape brought to you by Zion's Science Extreme Supplements available at GMC stores nationwide. Height advantage for Rivera as well as a reach advantage. And your referee for this fight is Mario Yamasaki. No doubt who the hometown fans are rooting for here. Without a doubt, of course, Rivera from Framingham, fighting out of Milford. Just are you ready? Where are we you are ready? Let's go! Big Boston Red Sox fan. Here we go. Hallman immediately takes it to the ground. That is something that Rivera does not want. Hallman is fresh. This is the beginning of the fight. He's not tired at all, and he's already in a dominant position in side control. This is very bad for Jorge Rivera. Dennis Hallman can finish this fight and finish this fight quick. He's got side control, and he's got Jorge locked up. He is slowly working his way to a better position. He's going for the mount. Jorge's got a butterfly. He's in guard now. Hallman might have got a little sloppy. Oh, he passed right back over to the other side. Wow, that's complete domination on the ground right there. He just sliced right through his guard. Dennis Hallman showing his expertise on the canvas. Not even a minute gone by in round number one. Explosive start. This might be his preferred side. A lot of guys have a dominant side uh, in, in, uh, when they're on the ground. Oh, big mistake. He let him roll him over. Not so good. A little sloppy. Jorge's waiting him out here. He's got his legs locked around his shoulder and he's got his arm extended, but it's uh, it's in a position right now where it's not totally in danger. He's a little high, he's high enough, so he's probably okay. Rivera trying to free that right arm, and he does. He's all right. Oh, now he's up. This is not a good spot for Dennis Hong. Mario Yamasaki telling Dennis to stand up, and this is Jorge's world. Jorge is a vicious striker. Holman had the plan at the beginning. He charged right at him, but Rivera has withstood the charge. Yeah, he had it. He had him on the ground. He had side control in both sides. He even switched sides, and uh, he made a sloppy mistake and got rolled over. He might have overestimated uh, his control or underestimated Jorge. Got a little overconfident. Thought he had control and uh, just relaxed a little. He paid the price, and now he's got to work for it again. Jorge Rivera has said, as long as I have air in my lungs, I'm game. I'll fight, certainly showing it early in this first round. Jorge is a warrior, but so is Dennis Hallman, for that matter. Halfway through round number one. Hallman patiently tie him up, push him up against the cage. He's got double underhooks now. This is a good spot for him. He's got his hands clasped together and double underhooks. Look for him to slowly work his weight down, lower on Jorge's body, pressing his chest and his face up against Jorge's chest, and then eventually, right there, then eventually try to take Jorge to the ground. He let go of the double underhooks and he's throwing some knees. I guess he feels pretty confident that he can contain Jorge against the cage, but you know, if Jorge gets loose, that guy's dangerous. He's got to work furiously right now to get Jorge to the ground. 
anytime Jorge is standing up, Dennis is at a disadvantage. Anytime Jorge is on the ground, Dennis is at the advantage. Uh-oh, Jorge's got the Muay Thai clinch. Knees! This is Jorge's world. You see Oh, trying to block. Good sprawl by Jorge Rivera. He's saying, come on, stand up. off once again. Coleman threw a kick and dropped his back. He's comfortable off his back. Oh, he's hurt. He got rocked. He has got to hold on to Jorge here. This is how Frank Trick stopped him. He's, he looks very badly hurt. Solid connections by Rivera. He's out of it. The hometown fans of El Conquistador. I thought Holman was out there. He didn't look like he was responding. He's got to do something here. He's got to tie up Jorge's upper body. Coleman started this round in a flash, but Rivera is ending it in a flurry. You know, he, this is the same mistake he made against Trigg. He allowed a guy in his guard to sit up, get posture, and drop punches down on him. You know, the whole point of the guard is either submit a guy or at the very least control him. I mean, he might be rocked already. That might be why he's uh, responding like this, but he's got to figure out a way to control Jorge Rivera's body, put some space between he and Jorge. Now Jorge wants him to stand up. Oh. Closing oh, seconds for round spinning, one. Spinning back fist, drops his back. Yeah, he's got to heal her. Oh, Jorge pulls him off. Jorge got out of that one at the end of the round, but an exciting conclusion to our first of three rounds of this match. Dennis Holman took control at the beginning, but Jorge Rivera Regain control at the end. Let's take a look at some of the replays. How are we doing? This was early on in the Here's round. Here's some elbows, some right elbows off the fence. He palms the head and throws those right elbows. And here's the end. Dennis Hallman goes for a spinning back fist. Drops down, grabs a hold of a heel, Jorge pushes him off. And that push off was before the end of the round. Taking a look at Dennis Holman getting instruction. Dennis Holman's corner is making it known in no uncertain terms. They want him to take Jorge Rivera down. Rivera able to land some incredible blows towards the end of round number one. We go to round number two in this middleweight matchup. in the red trunks, Rivera in the black. Mario Yamasaki puts them back on their feet. Well, originally in the first round, Joe Hallman was the aggressor. Now it's Rivera in the center of the octagon pushing forward. I do not like the way Dennis Hallman is walking forward. He's walking forward. And he's taking some shots. Good knees inside there. Knee by Rivera this time. Holman's doing a good job of blocking him. But he's got to get off the cage. He's got to get off the cage and get control of Jorge Rivera's body. What started that was a great uppercut by Rivera. But Rivera is so dominant standing up. I mean, there's just no competition. He's a much better stand-up fighter than Dennis Holman. You saw right there. They weren't big, but Holman letting those uppercuts in. Nice, nice elbow right there by Dennis Holman. Scheduled three round bout. The fans certainly on the side of Jorge El Conquistador Rivera. Just up the road in Massachusetts. He had a lot to cheer about in round number one. Mario Yamasaki separates them, which is not good news for Hallman. He's already winded. He's holding on to his knees. Now, this has been the case in a lot of Dennis Hallman's fights in the past, that he's had problems with conditioning. 
Good leg kick by uh, Rivera. Nice right hand. Nice counter by Dennis Hallman. Dennis Hallman staying alive in there. He's got heart. They get in that clinch. Both not afraid to throw the knees. Dennis Holmes done okay for himself in here, but it's just, it's not his best position. Oh, it took a good uppercut there. We know Rivera tough as nails, and as you said, Joe, he was able to take those David Wazzo elbows early in his career. Hallman is bleeding from the bridge of his nose now. And Rivera is targeting that blood. Hallman's got the tie clinch now, trying to work the knees inside. But this is, this is again, this is Rivera's game. Rivera also has been fighting at 105, 85 pounds his entire career, whereas this is Hallman's first experience in the octagon at 185. He's fought previously at 185, but in the big show, this is his first time. Time winding down in round number two. Close to a minute and a half left. Jorge Rivera throwing some tight body shots. Hallman can't keep taking those. He's going to chip away at his already weakened condition. You see the blood running down his nose. He looks up at the clock. And one minute and 27 seconds doesn't seem like a whole lot of time. But when you're in there with Jorge Rivera pounding on your body and you're tired, it can seem like eons. Jorge Rivera told us, I've got the skills and I belong here. Well, Jorge Rivera, without a doubt, stand-up wise, is at the top of the food chain. He is right up there with David Loazzo and, and some of the other top strikers at 185 pounds. His weakness has always been his ground game. And he's shown in this fight, at least, at the very least, excellent ground defense. Mario Yamasaki steps away. They might get a doctor to look at Dennis Hallman. He's bleeding all over the place. I don't like to see Hallman is squared off. Look at the way he's standing. He's almost completely square in front of him. That means he's got no balance. That means, I mean. Not to mention he's providing a bigger target, isn't yes, he? Yes, exactly. Well, you know, if Jorge was throwing uh, straight kicks, like down the middle, he would really have a bigger target. But it's just, it's a bad place. He can get knocked down easily from a punch. It, lo it looks like he's exhausted. Both fighters feeling the effects of two heavy rounds in the octagon. Close to 10 seconds left in round number two. It looks as though we will go to a third. Oh, big elbow by Jorge in tight. He's pointing on at the end of the round, making sure there's no question as to who won this. Mario Yamasaki separates them. The end of round number two. Oh, I don't see that round comfortably in. went to Jorge Rivera. Hey, Eric! We see Dennis Hallman being attended to. They will take a look at that cut. Dennis Hallman's corner telling him he needs some energy. There's an understatement. Let's take a look at the replay and see some of the damage that Jorge Rivera inflicted in that round. You see a wicked uppercut right there. Rocked Hallman. Right, left, right. Jorge Rivera with a clear advantage in the striking department. Very comfortable in there. They're telling him his hands are dragging. It's a tough corner. Outside. Long range. George, long range. Long range. His corner making sure he is focused. Jorge Rivera, you can hear the crowd shouting, Georgie. Are you ready? Are you ready? Let's go. Round final number round. three, the final round in our middleweight matchup. Again, look at Dennis Hallman's stance. He's almost completely squared off. His shoulders are, are, are facing him, like both shoulders are in the even distance. He doesn't have one shoulder in front and one behind like a traditional striker stance. He's standing like right in front of him. That's not good. Opposing him, Rivera, a much more traditional stance. Well, Rivera is listening to his corner, trying to keep this fight on the outside. He's being patient. 
Nice leg kick. Very nice. Can't take too many of those. Rivera said, every time I want to make him pay, and every time I get up, I want to wear down his will and his energy. It looks as though he took care of the energy part. Dennis Hallman does not look good here. He doesn't look like he has the energy to, energy to explode and try to take him down. He just ate a right hand. I mean, I'm not sure what he's waiting for. Another leg kick he eats. He's throwing a kick himself, but that was terrible. He looks very wobbly. That last kick was totally off balance, wasn't it? Absolutely. I mean, you can never say die. Dennis Hallman is, you know, a very experienced fighter. He, he's got, again, like we said, he's got over 67 professional fights, 57 victories. He's no slouch. I mean, I'm sure he's trying to figure out a way to solve this puzzle that Jorge Rivera is presenting him, but right now, that's not going to be the way. Trying to get some sort of knee action in there. He's, going he's for got the a leg. Down. There he goes. Now, this is more like it. He's got Jorge pressed up against the fence. But Jorge looks to be the much fresher fighter. And it doesn't look like he's having too hard a time shrugging this takedown attempt off. He's Under three minutes. He's controlling Hallman. He's got an overhook with his left arm, pressing his forearm against his chest with his right. There's no danger of being taken down. Now he's got that Muay Thai knee clinch. You see how he's going to spin around and get Hallman against the fence, which he did very easily. That just shows you how tired Dennis Hallman is. And Jorge uh, elects to let go of that. Oh, and he takes a knee for that. Over halfway through our final round. The fans willing something to happen at this point. Both fighters tired visibly. That cut opening up again on Dennis Holman. Mario Yamasaki stepping, separating them again. Oh, that's sloppy. Second time we've seen Holman go for that spin move. It's nice when you're fresh, but it's very difficult to pull out when you don't have that explosiveness anymore. Jorge should just start smashing leg kicks in. I mean, it didn't look like Holman had any defense against them. Fake the jab, throw that light, right leg kick. Well, at this point, there you see a mistake by Dennis Holman. Yeah, Jorge, screw this. He should just back away and let Holman stand up. I mean, he's, he's punish, punishing his legs here. But Holman is already tired. Well, if you're Rivera, do you just stay out of trouble? You know you've pretty much won this fight already. Yeah, I mean, sure, you can if you want to have a boring fight, but these guys don't want to give a boring performance. They want to come back to the UFC. They want to be considered, you know, at the, the top of the heap when, uh, you know, people are looking for opponents at 185 pounds. I mean, Jorge Rivera had a fight against Rich Franklin. He lost by armbar. I'm sure he would like to have a rematch. But he's going to have to do a little bit more to excite the fans than this. He's winning this fight, and uh, it looks like he's going to go on to win a clear unanimous decision, probably, if he doesn't get caught here. If he doesn't get caught here, Dennis Hallman's got a hold of a leg. Dennis Hallman is very dangerous. The, Jorge Rivera is slippery right here because it's late in the fight, and his leg is wet and sweaty. But Dennis Hallman is a submission wizard. If he can straighten out Jorge Rivera's leg, Jorge could be in a lot of trouble here. If he can grab a hold of that ankle and hang on tight and get something, whether it's a heel hook or a toe hold. Jorge's talking to him there. They know it's winding down. Less than 10 seconds left in this bout. He's going to wait out the clock. Absolutely tried his best at the end, but Jorge Rivera knew time was on his side. Let's send it inside the octagon to Ramiro, the freaking Puerto Rican, for the decision. Ladies and gentlemen, all three judges scored the ball 30 to 27, a unanimous decision in favor of your winner, Jorge El Conquistador Rivera. Let's get it started.
The first bout of the evening. One man has never been stopped in close to 50 fights. The other can fight in almost any weight class. Joe Diesel Riggs is a heavy-handed striker who says that he could stand with anyone in the world. Riggs, a former heavyweight, is extremely strong and believes that it's only a matter of time until he rises to the top. After dropping from heavyweight to middleweight, Riggs now makes his welterweight debut. The fight's going to be furious and fast. I mean, it could be on the ground. I don't know what he's planning, but it's going to be it's going to be quick and it's going to be nasty. So you guys expect fireworks. Chris Lights Out Lytle is a well-rounded veteran with over 40 mixed martial arts fights on his record. While he is known as an excellent grappler, Lytle is also a professional boxer with a 13-1-1 record. Lytle has established a reputation for being extremely tough, and he has never been stopped in a fight. I can win at any position. I can win on my feet. I can win on the ground. I can win by submission. I can win by decision. I can win by knockout. So if I fight to the best of my ability, you know, it would depend on him. But I feel like, you know, I'm going to win the fight. Coming up next, Joe Diesel Riggs takes on Chris Lights Out Lionel. We take a look at the tale of the tape, brought to you by Science. Science Extreme Supplements, available at GNC stores nationwide. 23-year-old Joe Riggs stands 6-0, a couple inches higher than Chris Lytle, but their reach is almost identical. When the action begins, our referee in charge of this contest is Big John McCarthy. We begin the first of our fights here. Three scheduled rounds, but both these fighters, Joe, would love to end it early, wouldn't they? Absolutely, and uh, both have very similar styles. Both very good boxers with very good submission backgrounds. I'd give the edge in submission to Chris Lytle, the edge in power to Joe Riggs. Well, you mentioned that fight that Joe Riggs had against Ivan Salivary earlier. He mentioned in his interviews that he just got too anxious in that fight. Well, he made a mistake. He got caught with a kick from underneath. Uh, he got rocked a little, and Ivan is a crafty veteran. Immediately secured a triangle for the tap out. Whoa! Taking a miss. Lytle physically, right away, you can tell, is a much smaller man. I mean, Joe Riggs is enormous at 170 pounds. Riggs weighed in at 170, but as Nice takedown. Beautiful takedown by Chris Lytle, and beautiful pass. Very nice. Now, one thing he said about uh, Joe Riggs when the two of them rolled together is that Joe Riggs is very good at getting out of submissions, understanding what Chris Lytle's trying to do to him, and avoiding it. Lytle has passed the guard. He's on top at side control right now. He's got head and arm control, and he's looking to do something here. Secure an arm, secure a choke. Riggs is looking to get his leg inside. He's got it. Now he's back to half guard. Better position for Riggs. Nope. Lytle got through it, shook it off. Now he's in side control again. Good control by Lytle. He stepped right into half guard. I'm not sure what he was doing there. Riggs up against the cage. Lytle just tapping him on the side, letting him know he's there. Now the taps go to the head. He's basically softening him up, just looking to get some sort of submission. He's looking to pass, now he's in half guard. He's gonna look to try to get his right leg out from in between Joe Riggs' two legs. Joe Riggs is in a slightly better defensive position right here because he's got, there he goes. Now he's in full guard, this is much better for Riggs. Lytle can throw some punches from here, but not much. Now we'll see if Riggs has any submissions off of his back. Yeah, Riggs is a heavy puncher. He can do some damage, actually, even from his back. Oh, he went for Noma Plata. He rolled it over. He secured it. He wants to get a little tighter to, to Chris Lytle's body. Chris Lytle is outside. He can slip his arm out there. That's it right there. That's even better. That's better for Joe Riggs. Joe Riggs has got to sit up. Dude, that, that's phenomenal technique by Joe Riggs. He's got a pass here. Now he's on top. Chris Lytle throwing punches from the bottom. Very nice technique by Joe Riggs. Joe Riggs in guard right now, but Lytle squirmed out of one. Lytle has talked about how comfortable he is when he's in bad positions. He specifically targets his training that way. 
I'm sure he probably targeted, or excuse me, trained to uh, to be fighting off his back, considering he's fighting such a strong guy. He's a very well-rounded fighter, Chris Lytle. He's got he's got excellent submissions. Joe Riggs in side control now. Stepping over. Lytle able to get away from the force of that. He's got club. his back. He's got one hook in. Nice, good job by Chris Lytle rolling out of that. He's very aware of what's going on. He's got one leg locked up here in half guard. It looked like he was looking to spin, try to get some sort of a leg lock or something, but right now he's just dealing with Joe Riggs' heavy hands. An energetic and entertaining first round, almost four minutes in. Joe's looking to push his leg out. He's in half guard right here. His left leg is stuck in between Tris, Chris's two legs. Now Chris is in full guard. He's using his knees to keep him away. Oh, big legs. Big left hand by Joe Riggs. These are dangerous. He has such heavy hands. We saw him with, you know, very experienced jiu-jitsu fighter Joe Dirks, and he just pounded him out like this from the guard. It may very, very well be lights out for Chris Lytle. Well, Chris Lytle is very tough. I mean, I, we've seen him dropped. He got dropped by Robbie Lawler, but actually literally applauded right after he got dropped. That was a crazy fight. He's, he's got a great chin and great heart, and it's going to be real tough to take him out. Riggs brings another one down. Looping wide, crazy powerful shots by Joe Riggs. Raining powerful blows from the sky in this last minute. Joe Riggs just throwing brutal punches and elbows from the top. I mean, Chris can't keep it. Chris's eye is swelling up very badly, his right eye. Probably from one of those elbows. I mean, those are incredible, powerful punches. Round one ends, Joe. What worse by Joe Riggs. Clearly in command of that first round. Chris Lyman took a lot of punishment in that round. And he looks very wobbly headed back to his corner. Taking a look at Chris Lytle, and you are right. He barely can stand up. Let's, let's take a look at the replay. Let's look at some of these huge bombs. I mean, that one is right on the chin. He's got nowhere to go. I mean, just look at the distance those punches are traveling. And Chris's head is pinned to the canvas here. Here's another one. Bang! I mean, wide, powerful punches by Joe Riggs. Just wild caveman punches. Right Joe Riggs letting him fly, but coming up, we have Forrest Griffin and Elvis Sinisek, the light heavyweight matchup between two men who both want the victory here at the Mohegan Sun. Wow, Chris Lytle's eyes swelling up very badly. Round number two, ready to begin. Joe Riggs has said, I can't lose this fight. I'm desperate for a win. I won't lose. There are no other options. Touch glove, show respect at the beginning of the second round. Nice right hand by Lytle. Let those hands go! Come on! Let them go! Big swing, a takedown by Joe Riggs. I was talking to heavyweight, former heavyweight champion Tim Sylvia this morning. Tim Sylvia was just commenting on how ridiculously strong Joe Riggs is, about how uh, he gets Joe Riggs in side control, and most fighters, when he gets on side control, he says he can just hold him down. I mean, Tim's an enormous guy, you know, six foot eight, 265 pounds. Nice reversal by Chris Lytle, but he says that Joe Riggs, he, he can't hold down. Now, let's see if Chris Lytle can hold him down. That was a beautiful reversal by Chris Lytle. Lytle, an impressive record. 29 and 11 and 4 in MMA. Boxer as well. Yeah, he has several professional boxing fights under his belt. He's a really well rounded fighter. Lytle said he originally just got into boxing, Joe, to help out his MMA, but now with the success that he's had, he's not too sure. He might uh, devote a little more time to it. Well, there's a lot of money in boxing, but the money in MMA is slowly starting to rise, especially with the notoriety that these fighters are gaining from the uh, fighter television show and the uh, live, live bouts that Spike TV is airing. 
I mean, I think eventually it's going to swallow boxing up. Absolutely. The era of MMA has just dawned, and it will only get bigger. Chris Lytle doing his part to keep Riggs on his back, but look, the blood starting to pour. Yeah, he's got a cut on his forehead. Big John's going to step in and get a doctor to look at it. Joe Riggs covered in Chris Lytle's blood. Yeah, that's a, that's a bad cut. Chris is wobbling, too. It's hard to tell. Oh, stopping the fight. That's it. That's, a, that's surprisingly quick. Big John McCarthy has stopped it. It is lights out for Chris Lytle. Sort of a bittersweet victory. I mean, it's a stoppage by cut when he was on his back. And Chris Lytle was in control of him. I'm sure he didn't want it to end this fight. Thank you. No, man, that was a great fight. Say, I'm sorry. Let's take a look at the replay and see the left elbow that causes this cut. Joe Riggs dangerous from his back. Bang, right there. One of the things that makes mixed martial arts so accessible to so many fans. That is a never nasty cut. Wow, that is a deep, nasty cut. Let's take a look at the takedown here. Another look at the replay. Some more damage by Joe Riggs. He throws a big left hand, swings, and immediately shoots for the takedown. Gets the trip. Bang. And here's the reversal by Chris Lytle. He's joking. He's joking. Lytle showing excellent sweeps, uses the butterfly, gets the double underhooks, puts Joe Riggs on his back, but unfortunately for him, did not stop that elbow, got cut, and the fight is over. Let's take one more look at that elbow that caused the cut that stopped the fight. Joe Riggs off his back, holds onto Chris's head, bang, as soon as Chris comes in. Beautiful technique by Joe Riggs. Absolutely, Riggs just using the force of Lytle coming down with the combination of his elbow going up. And as he said, it's not the way he wanted to happen, but let's send it inside to the veteran voice of the Octagon, Bruce Buffer, for the decision. Ladies and gentlemen, on the doctor's advice, referee John McCarthy is called to stop to this contest at two minutes of round number two. For the winner by TKO, Joe DeSlo And Riggs said expect fireworks and he delivered. Let's send it into Joe. All right, I'm here with Joe Diesel Riggs. Joe, congratulations. Now, Joe, I know that you and Chris are good friends. How difficult was it facing a good friend in the octagon? Believe it or not, it was pretty damn hard. If, if anybody here has met Chris, he's the greatest guy in the world, man. It was pretty hard. It was real hard. And plus, he's a tough fighter. Very tough fighter. Let's take a look at the elbow that stopped the fight. Did you see this coming? Did you plan this out? I was planning that way because I kept pushing his head away. I was planning on catching him with an elbow, but he had a good, good defense early. But damn, got him right there. I thought he was out, but he was, but he could regain. The guy's a tough motherfucker. You know, damn. I mean, I, I don't know. Now, Joe, I mean, you've gone through an incredible metamorphosis. You, from 300 pounds down to 170 now. Do you feel comfortable at this weight? Do you think you're going to stay here? I am. I can't make the weight without Billy Rush. It's impossible. But with Billy's help, I can make any weight. And uh, I plan to stay here, yeah. Well, incredible victory. Great bombs. Really exciting fight. And we really look forward to seeing what you're going to do at Welterweight. Yeah, thank you. I just want to say thanks to Jeremy Horn, Rich Franklin, Tim Sylvia, all the guys in Cincinnati, George. And Phoenix, Arizona, I'm coming home a winner, baby. I love you guys. Joe Diesel Riggs, ladies and gentlemen. I love you, Dad. I love you, Jason, Andy, Mom. I love you guys. There's a score to settle between our next two fighters, and both are fully committed to punishing their opponent. Pain is the name of the game, and both men expect to enforce their will. Chael Sonnen is an excellent wrestler known for his speed and tenacity. An NCAA All-American and U.S. Olympic team alternate, Sonnen trains with the world-class athletes of Team Quest. Sonnen and Babalu have a history, and the UFC newcomer is convinced he has what it takes to take out his tough Brazilian rival. A lot of people talk to me about giving up some size uh, to Babalu. You know, I push people Babalu size out of the way looking for somebody to fight. 
Renato Babaluso Brawl is one of the top light heavyweight fighters in the world. The mega talented Brazilian fighter has won his last eight fights in a row, including winning a one night tournament where he defeated Trevor Prangley, Jeremy Horn, and Mauricio Shogun Hua to win the IFC Light Heavyweight Championship. Babalu forced Shogun, who recently won the Pride Grand Prix, to tap out to a guillotine choke. Babalu feels focused and wants a shot at the UFC World Light Heavyweight title. So Brawl has fought Chael Sonnen before in a very very controversial fight, and Babalu vows to end this feud once and for all tonight. He gonna have a problem after that because maybe her and his girlfriend did not recognize him after this fight. Coming up next, Team Quest Chael Sonnen takes on Renato Babalu Sabral. Time for the tale of the tape, brought to you by Zions. Zions Extreme Supplements, available at GNC stores nationwide. Sobral, 30 years of age, son and 28. They are identical six in one heights, but Sobral has a two inch reach advantage. And when the action begins, our referee in charge of the octagon is Herb Dean. You can bet Joe Herb Dean will have his eye on this one. Yeah, this could get ugly. There's a lot of hate in Hanato Babalu Sabral's eyes. But sometimes hate is your enemy. Sometimes emotions are your enemy in the ring or the octagon. Got to stay calm, cool, and collected when fighting. He's doing the Vanderlei Silva patented wrist roll. And he touches the glove. Surprising. I was just going to say, somewhat surprising. Oh, big right hand by Babalu. Babalu in the camo shorts. Sonnen in the red and black shorts. Sonnen weighed in under the 205 pound weight division and Babalu cuts weight to get to that division. So uh, we'll see if that has any bearing on the fight, the size advantage enjoyed by Babalu. You talk about the emotion and the, and the look in the eye of Babalu. Sonnen the exact opposite. To him, he just seems very calm and focused on what he needs to do. Sometimes that's a good thing. But Babalu, again, is a, oh, Babalu's got a standing arm triangle. He's got it. If he can lock a hold of his bicep, right now he's got a hold of it with his hands, and it's, it's dangerous, but if he can get it, lock a hold, put his right hand on his left bicep, and put his left hand on his ear and squeeze down, then he'll have optimum leverage, and he can finish this off from here. What he's got to do is he's got to slide his right hand up his shoulder, excuse me, up his forearm, and onto his bicep. He's got it here, though, and if he can take it to, oh, okay, Chael's out of danger. Chael, that incredible wrestling background. Hanato is an excellent wrestler himself. And Babalu has said that he doesn't fear his wrestling ability at all. The first time uh, Chael actually saw Hanato Babalu Sabral is when he was in college and Babalu came with the, Brazil, uh, the Brazilian wrestling team to uh, train at Colorado Springs. And uh, he said he admired him from, as an athlete, but he had to go from when he started competing in mixed martial arts from admiring him to trying to defeat him. And to continue with that story, didn't he actually told his mom, look, look, there's Babalu. Yeah. yeah, interesting. Now here he is in a cage with him. Let's start working, guys. Work. Babalu trying to get those knees up. Chael has spent most of this round up against the octagon. Little punches inside, but they don't do too much damage. Good knee inside the chair. Approaching the halfway point of round number one. This round started off in a flurry, in a fury, I should say. Okay, Bob Lou's got him down now. Chael back up to his feet. Shows a good chin. He's on his back. Whoa, nice reversal by Chael. Babalu takes him down, and Chael immediately reverses him. But Babalu is dangerous, dangerous off his back. We saw him catch an armbar on Travis View. He's recently trained with uh, Gracie Baja team and really vastly improved his submissions. Under two minutes in round number one. 
Shale so, showing a lot of heart, absorbing that kick and the, the punch afterwards. And he made, oh, good kicks from the bottom by Babalu. Once again, Shale down in guard. I mean, just those kicks alone show you how complete some of these athletes are, how they approach each different position and have solutions in each different position. I mean, it's not just a matter of lying on your back. It's a, that's an opportunity to strike. When that guy's above you, you can kick him. You can throw up your legs and try to catch him in an armbar. You saw Diesel Riggs end his fight with an elbow from his back. I mean, these guys are evolving and learning how to be offensive from every position. And that includes when they're up against the cage, as we see Babalu. Chael's doing a really good job of avoiding getting his arms stuck in there. Babalu keeps throwing his hips up and rotating, trying to catch an arm, but Chael sees it coming a mile away and yanks his arms out. We are under a minute in round number one. Good punches by Chael. Connects with that right. He's in half guard now. Do some real damage. He's going to have to get out of this position, figure out a way to get his left leg. Oh, Babalu got a heel hook. Oh, Chael's grimacing in pain. He's got it in tight. This could be it. Whoa. He might have to tap. Wow. He rolled it over. Chael was grimacing in pain, but he absorbed it. Look at this. He's still got a foot. Babalu is using it. as though Chael was in trouble. Chael walked away and he wasn't limping, so I think he's okay. Let's take a look at the replay, that big kick from Hanato Babalu. Sonnen took a punch sideways. Afterwards. But you know what? That, that shows you how important it is to keep your hands up. He, could, he caught that kick with his hand. Listen to this. Just listening to it. Chael Son and screaming in agony, but gutting it out and making it out of that round. Even to be able to hear that scream over this packed house. That right there is, that's just picture perfect textbook example of why it's so important to keep your hands up. If he hadn't had his hands up right there, he would have been knocked unconscious. Look at Sonnen's face here. I mean, he is in some serious pain here. I've been caught in heel hooks before. It sucks. It is a very, very painful position that rips your meniscus apart inside your knee. The body is not meant to bend that way, is it, partner? No, it definitely is not. Let's see if uh, Chael shows any ill effects from it. He's not limping at all. He seems to be fine. We begin round two. And that is a knee that he has wrapped already. I wonder if that knee was hurt before. Oh, good leg kick and a takedown by Babalu. Chael doing a good job of controlling him. I I'm impressed with Chael's uh, composure. His first time in the octagon, he looks very comfortable. Early seconds in round number two. Nice, beautiful job by Chael Sonnen of throwing Babalu off and then casually stepping on top of him and starting throwing bombs. Chael Sonnen is no joke. You mentioned the team he's with, Team Quest. He takes a lot of pride in being with that team even before it had a name. Yeah, he was there two years before it was even Team Quest. I mean, that is a, that's a phenomenal team. Like we said, Randy Couture, Nate Corey, Matt Lindland. I mean, so many good fighters come from up there. Two Pinato's minutes. Rolling. Look at that. Throwing his arms, his legs up over and over again, securing his shoulder. But Chael doing a really good job of rotating out of it. Looks like he's got a triangle here. He's caught. He got him. That's it. He did not put the loose of blow with a beautiful win by submission. Chael looked like he was okay. He shook it off once. But then Hanato secured it the second time. A victory he said he wanted. It was personal, but afterwards a great show of respect both between you guys, these two. From both you guys, you be Let's take a look at the replay here and see the triangle that finished it. He got out of it the first time, and Babalu just threw it up again. Chael maybe a little too confident that he could get out of it a second time. This time, 
Babalu pulls the head down, secures the triangle by grabbing a hold of his right foot and securing it under his left knee, locking his arm and his leg for the tap. He had his arm trapped in there, his legs were tight around his head, and Chael Sonnen was forced to tap. Let's take another look at it. He pulls the right foot down, securing it under the left knee. He's got a hold of his arm with his other arms. I mean, it's an arm bar and a triangle at the same time. Chael was forced to tap. The composer of Chael Sonnen falls to the relentless ferocity of Babalu. Let's send it inside to the veteran voice of Bruce Buffer for the decision. Ladies and gentlemen, referee Herb Dean has called a stop to this contest at one minute, 20 seconds of round number two. Due to a tap out from a triangle arm bar, declaring the winner, Renato Babalu Sobral. An absolute look of relief from Hanato Babalu Sobral. So focused, and finally, he gets the culmination of his victory. Well, we are at UFC 55 Fury. Forrest Griffin is riding a wave of popularity rarely rivaled in this sport, while Elvis Sinisic would love to continue his role of spoiler and with the win, see his street cred skyrocket. Please welcome Forrest Griffin! I'll be honest, you know, I, I think I'm the underdog here, and I think the majority of the people out there think I'm the underdog. If I'm a favorite going into this fight, I want to see if I can change his luck as far as being a spoiler. Wow. Oh, he's got it working! Let's see if there's a finish. Let's see what happens here. There's the tap! Elvis Sinisa, victorious in his UFC debut! So I like to go in, go in the underdog and just blow everything out of the water. You know, it's been a long time since he's been to the UFC. He's been away, he's been fighting, he's been getting better. So I really am not sure what to expect. Part of what I've been working on is not so much my striking, even though I am constantly working on improving that, but more my takedown defense. Against Elvis Sinisic, I really don't want to go to the ground. Um, I've got a decent clinch background, some decent wrestling. I hope that I can use my clinch to stay off the mat with him. What's going to make this such an exciting fight is his versatility. Forrest has the ability to bang on his feet, tie up in the clinch, use knees or takedowns, as well as once it hits the ground, he's got, you know, submission skills. Very bad position for Bill Mahut. Mahut trying to survive. Mahut's down to That's it. It's all over. I'm not really known for that, but it doesn't mean I can't, you know, fight on the ground. And as far as how well I fight on the ground, we'll find that out later tonight. If I end up on the ground, it doesn't matter whether I'm on top or underneath, I'm dangerous. And uh, hopefully Forrest knows that, because if he doesn't, he'll be in for a surprise. I want to fight this fight as a boxing match, not a kickboxing match, not a submission match. Because those are two things he's very good at. So I want to capitalize on what I'm good at and just box. You know, Forrest Griffin is a really nice guy, but I didn't travel halfway around the world to make friends. Time once again for the tale of the tape, brought to you by Zion. Science, extreme supplements available at GNC stores nationwide. A lot of experience on the side of Elvis Sinisic. You said it, Joe, that same height and really the same reach. When the action begins, our referee in charge of the octagon is Mario Yamasaki. We already talked about the rules in the locker room. You guys have any other questions? I want you guys to do a hard fight and a clean fight, okay? And there we have it. Set to go. And as I said, Eddie Bravo with us. The crowd on their feet as both fighters Eddie, approach the octagon. The loudest cheers go. goes certainly for Forrest Griffin. Touch gloves, sign of respect. Forrest Griffin, who lists one of his hobbies as going to bullfights on acid. <laughs> I think that was a line from Caddyshack, wasn't it? I might have dated myself. Whoa, nice left hook and right hand by Elvis. Good jab by Forrest Griffin. Nice leg kick, both, both sides by Elvis. Nice leg kick by Forrest. This has all the makings of another Stefan Bonner Forrest Griffin fight. <laughs> Elvis.
Elvis is a very intelligent guy, and he's been away from the octagon for a couple years, and I'm sure he's been improving. And I've actually been very, whoa, good right hand by Elvis. I've been very much looking forward to seeing him fight again to see what, what his improvement is. And Joe, we talked about how his time away from the octagon was really to make that decision to fully commit. When he was in the octagon earlier, he was balancing a serious job with fighting. Now it's fighting 100%. Elvis is very good on his feet so far. Good counter punching. Wow, he's uh, he's getting the better of these exchanges. Well, if you looked on paper at the record of Elvis Sinisic, you might be mistaken. But as you mentioned, Joe, this guy has fought some warriors. Wow, Elvis is doing a really good job of countering Forrest, staying just outside of his punches, and countering him with punches and leg kick. Nice leg kick by Forrest. Nice leg kick by Elvis. This is Forrest kind of fight. He loves a war. Oh, he rocked Elvis there with that left hook. Elvis is rocked, and he comes back with a, with a hook of his own. Good knee inside by Elvis. Nice uppercuts by Forrest. Sinisic able to connect a couple times. Forrest Griffin breathing heavy. These guys are going at it. This is, like I said, this is Forrest's kind of fight. He loves a war of attrition. He is a tough guy, and he loves to test himself. Good right hand by Elvis. Over halfway down in round number one. Sinisic, the aggressor. Good counter punches by Elvis. Oh, good left hook got inside by Forrest. Elvis counters. Another connection by Griffin. Another left hook. Griffin getting in with that left. Nice inside kick. Forrest Griffin said he wanted to concentrate on boxing while he's getting his wish. It was that left hook again. We saw it earlier in the first round. Forrest is connecting with that left hook. Very difficult task for Forrest Griffin. He passes with flying colors. Wow. The king of rock and rumble comes up just a little bit short against Forrest Griffin. Let's take a look at the replay. Elvis, look, his head was standing straight up. And Forrest is connecting over and over and with that uppercut, let's take a look at the stoppage of the fight. See, Elvis's head is standing straight up. Uppercut, bang, left hook. That was the one that did it. Ma you know, Mario Yamasaki stopped it. It could be argued that maybe it could have gone on, but clearly Elvis was hurt. Let's take a second look at it. Forrest is flurrying, he senses Elvis is hurt, and then boom, puts him away with the left. He goes to follow up, but Mario Yamasaki stops it. Yamasaki was looking for any sign that Sinisek could handle any more of a barrage. Let's send it inside the octagon once again to the veteran voice of the octagon, Bruce Buffer, for the decision. Ladies and gentlemen, referee Mario Yamasaki has called a stop to this contest at three minutes, 30 seconds of the very first round, declaring the winner by TKO, Horace Griffin! Well, if there was any doubt in anyone's mind that Forrest Griffin was a fan favorite before this fight, that's over now. You heard him. Let's send it inside to Joe. All right, Forrest, the last time we saw you in the octagon, you won, won by submission. Is this more your style? Yeah, brother. Hey, you know, I never said, I never said I was that good or that pretty, but baby, I have to make it exciting, you know? What more can you ask for? 
Well, I don't think anybody could ask for anything more than that. <laughs> that was an incredibly exciting fight. Let's take a look at the end of the fight. Talk us through this. Uh, that's me swinging wildly. Me swinging wildly some more. Total shoulder punches, uh, no pivot, no technique, a lot of luck. You had caught him earlier with the left hey, hook. Uh, did you sense he was open for the left hook? Uh, you know, I did, but what, what changed that is when he caught me with about, I don't know, right before this happened, he caught me with the left hook, and I was rocked. I was like, oh, I gotta do something here. So I'd start charging forward, throwing bolos. All right, now, Forrest, this is a great win over a UFC mixed martial arts veteran. You're obviously, you're moving up the ladder. What, what do you think happens next? How, how much further do you want to push this? How much further before you get a title shot? What do I want, Dan? I want to fight the best, you know? Preferably the best stand-up guys. Who's that, Dan? Who do I want to fight? I think that's Chuck Liddell. Hey, you know what, though? Seriously, if I fought Chuck, I'm not saying it wouldn't end with my face in the canvas, but it'd be a good fight until then. Well, you know what? We look forward to seeing it either way, and we love watching you compete. Forrest Griffin, ladies and gentlemen. Both fighters in our next bout can't wait to swing into action. Both have extensive resumes, and both heavyweights are capable of finishing their opponent with one powerful blow. The Iron Lion, Brandon Lee Hinkle, is an NCAA Division II National Wrestling Champion and a U.S. National Freestyle All-American. Hinkle possesses heavy hands and loves to break up his opponent with vicious ground-and-pound tactics. Hinkle feels his athletic ability will carry him far in the heavyweight division. I'm the cream of the crop of the heavyweight in the world. I've, I've solidified my weight now, or I'm not ballooned up at the weight, and I just feel that he's, he's, he's outmatched. Sean the Cannon Gannon is a six-time Golden Gloves champion, a Northeast Regional Boxing champion, a Massachusetts State Heavyweight Black Belt Judo champion, a North American Grappling Association World Champion, and a full-time Boston police officer. Gannon likes to slug and feels confident that anyone who tries to strike with him will not stay conscious long. I have respect for any man who has what it takes to step into the octagon, but if he tries to stand and trade with me for more than 10 seconds, he's going to be counting the ceiling lights. Coming up next, the Iron Lion, Brandon Lee Hinkle, takes on Sean the Cannon Gannon. We take a look now at the tail of the tape, brought to you by Zion's Zion's Extreme Supplements, available at GNC stores nationwide. Sean Gannon, 35 years of age, an inch height advantage, and a two and a half inch reach advantage over Brandon Lee Hinkle. When the action begins, our referee in charge is Herb Dean. We saw it with Bob Lou earlier. You called it the fight face. Looks like Gannon's got one too, Joe. He's a very calm and confident guy. I mean, that's the same face that he had in that video when he fought Kimbo Slice in a, a really stressful situation. Almost like a poker face. You just can't read anything by it. But right now, Brandon Lee Hinkle better read something. Sean Gannon better look out for the takedown. Brandon Lee Hinkle is uh, definitely the superior wrestler. Hinkle in the blue trunks, Sean Gannon in the black trunks. Good left by Sean. Brandon shoots a good takedown defense by Gannon. Hinkle tying him up, shooting for a leg, nice. Good job by Brandon Lee Hinkle. Went under the swing of Gannon, able to take him down. Hinkle is in Gannon's guard now, looking to drop some elbows, punches down. I don't know what that was all about. Was right out of a Sakuraba <laughs> fight. Gannon trying to put some elbows on the mark. Brandon Lee Hinkle trying to pass and get into side control. Gannon doing a good job of keeping him in his guard. This is the thing with these heavyweights, isn't it? So much weight in the octagon. They can throw a lot of force. Good elbows by Gannon from the bottom. I mean, you're seeing, uh, we, we talked about this in earlier fights, guys taking advantage of every position to be offensive. Brandon is now in the half guard. He's gonna look to pass, which means he's gonna push down on his legs and get his right leg out. There he goes, he did it. Now he's in side control. Now he's got his back. He's mounted, bad spot for Sean Gannon. 
Good elbows by Brandon Lee Hinkle from the top. Sean's trying to buck him off. He's got a Kimura. Sean's free of it. We talked about that overseas experience of Brandon Lee Hinkle, but now that he's back in the U.S. He's got the Kimura again. He's got to suck it tight to Sean's body. He's got it outside of Sean's body. What he's got to do is he's got to pull it tight to his body. It's the Americana. He's got to pull it tight to his body and then try to submit him with it. But he's free of it. Gannon doing a good job to escape some early clinches. Go back to that comment about the overseas experience, though, Joe. He has never lost in the U.S., has Brandon Lee Hinkle. He's going for the Americana again. He's got it on the other side now. Now, he's not going to get it from there, but what he's got to do is he's got to suck that elbow into Sean Gannon's body. The tighter he pulls into Sean Gannon's body, the more force it puts on his shoulder. He keeps going to that over and over again. That might be his go-to move. On the side, fully past the guard. Now, he's dominating Sean Gannon here. Knees to the body now. Again, he's going for it. I mean, he he has it locked up. The only thing that he's missing is he's got to pull it tight to Sean Gannon's body. It's a very common mistake that people make. It's a simple change in, in the lever, but it makes a huge difference. Hinkle having his way right now with Gannon. Elbows to the body as well as elbows to the face. Sean Gannon is not going to give up, though. He is a, an incredibly tough guy. He's taking some punishment, but he's got an iron chin. And if Hinkle doesn't stop him here, he's going to be there in the second round. Mounted again. Sean Gannon is just getting dominated on his feet. Full mount. Oh, the blood flowing out of Sean Gannon. Those raining elbows. Oh, big elbows by Hinkle. Whoa, bloody mess now. Oh, cutting elbows. Oh, devastating elbows by Brandon Lee Hinkle. Sean Gannon is a bloody mess. They're going to stop this fight. That's it. That's it. Herb Dean wow. has stopped it. What a bloody mess. And Brandon Lee Hinkle. Wow, very impressive performance by Brandon Lee Hinkle. Vicious elbows from the mount. Wow, ground and pound indeed. The Let's, sign says it all, Joe. Absolutely. Let's take a look at the replay. I mean, he's in the half guard here, and Sean is doing nothing to stop this, just covering up, and you see the grimace of pain on his face. Blood is just pouring out of his nose and face. Just unanswered blows. Referee Herb Dean has no choice but to stop this fight. That is a bloody mess. Here's the ground and pound that started off from side control. Those are the elbows that started. Just relentless elbow attack by Brandon Lee Hinkle. Those elbows started it all. He used those elbows, as we talked about, Joe, to not only the head, but to the body. Yeah, he uh, vicious ground and pound assault by Brandon Lee Hinkle. We send it to the veteran voice of the octagon, Bruce Buffer, for the decision. Ladies and gentlemen, referee Herb Dean has called a stop to this contest at 4 minutes 14 seconds of round number one for the winner by TKO, the Iron Lion, Brandon Lee Hickle. Wow, what a job by Brandon Lee Hinkle. He stays undefeated in the U.S. Let's send it inside to Joe. All right, I'm here with the winner, Brandon Lee Hinkle. Brandon, congratulations. Welcome to the Ultimate Fighting Championship. Now, I know you're a veteran of mixed martial arts. You, you fought many, many times. Did you, how did you feel about coming in here uh, and fighting a guy whose biggest, res, res, biggest credential on his resume was an underground fight on the internet? Ah, uh, he's tough as nails. Anyone who steps up is great. Uh, I'm just happy to be here. I'm emotional, feeling lightheaded, but I'm happy. That's okay, it. we're gonna take a look at the, the replay of the fight, the, the finish of the fight. Talk us through this, some of the brutal ground and pound here. That's Mark Coleman's finest right there. Ground and mother effing pound, that's it. 
All right, now, Brandon, you've been around for a long time. You fought a lot of tough guys. You finally made it to the UFC. Who would you like to fight here next? The champ. Whoever that is. Whoever that is. I don't care, Joe. What's your call on tonight's bout for the title? Orvalovsky by KO. All right, we look forward to seeing you again. Brandon Lee Hinkle, congratulations. Thanks to all my sponsors. West Liberty, Jefferson, Weirton, what's up to Brazil, and Korea. Well, moving on, it is now time for our main event, and we have promised you a good one, and now we aim to deliver. Andre Arlovsky against the headhunter, Paul Wentello. There you see the matchup. It's for the heavyweight title, the UFC Championship of the World for the unified belt. And Andre Arlovsky would like nothing more than to keep that belt. Some have said Arlovsky has taken this fight lightly. Others have said he needs to earn this title. Well, and Andre Arlovsky gets a chance now to prove and to earn it. Who's the best striker? I want that test. I want to, you know, prove to myself 10 times as more than I want to prove to the fan that I can beat Alaski. If I beat Paul Buntello, UFC bring me another opponent and I, I fight him against my next opponent, but first I must beat uh, Paul Buntello. Yeah, he's bigger. You know, yeah, he got some muscles, but I've been dropping those guys for eight years. He's just another one on my platter. Oh, he's gone! He's gone! He's gone! He's a very good striker, but I, I think he's no uh, jiu-jitsu too. It's a bad spot. Pop went down. Oh, it's out. It's out. He had a guillotine. I'm ready for him. Oh, he's out. This man is not human. So I think it's right now my time. I'm very happy, of course. I've been living the underdog life for eight years. This is nothing to me. So I have nothing to lose. Leave everything in the cage, and I'm happy with what I've done. Maybe he's a control freak on, on, in the cage, but um, I'm not going to allow that, and I'm going to bring a lot of pressure. Oh, big right hand! He drops him with a right hand and finishes him with a heel hook! I have a chance to catch his leg, and I'm doing a leg lock. Don't let him control the fight. That's the main thing about this. I'm doing what I want. Are you ready? Are you ready? Let's get it on! Bell rings, take the center of the cage, and keep coming forward, checking his kicks, bobbing and weaving his shots, checking his kicks, and make him pay. Of course, I have a game plan, but... When the bell fight starting, I'm doing everything for my victory. I'm not going to shoot. I'm not going to take him down. I'm going to stand at the end. I want to win this fight in the ground, in the standing. I want to win. The fight ends. My hands are raised. Dana White's wrapping a heavyweight championship belt around my waist. Well, Joe, Andre Arlovsky feels this really is his time, and most people would agree he is one of the most complete fighters the UFC has ever seen. But the question remains, can he complete the job tonight? Well, you know what? We've seen Arlovsky grow and transform into a fighter. We saw him in his first bout against Rico Rodriguez with stop. We saw him against Pedro Hizzo with stop. And we've seen the metamorphosis. We've seen the growth. We've seen him go on to destroy Vladimir Matyushenko, Ian Freeman. And, you know, he just is completely dominant now. His fight with Justin Eilers showed a complete mixed martial arts athlete. His fight with former champion Til Sylvia knocked Tim Sylvia down and then finished him with an ankle lock. I mean, he's an amazing athlete, a physical specimen who has honed his body with discipline and hard training over the years and showed how he's learned from his mistakes and grown. And he's only 26 years old. Well, Paul Buentello, his opponent, he says he's got no pressure on him. He would love nothing more than to stand toe to toe with Andre Arlovsky and prove who is the best striker in the UFC. Is that his only hope? Well, you know what? He has a lot of hope. You know, make no mistake about it, Paul Buentello is a serious threat. He comes from an incredible camp, American Kickboxing Academy in San Jose, which has some great fighters out of it. Josh Koscheck, Mike Swick, you know, Mike Kyle. There's so many good guys come out of that camp, and he has pinpoint, very accurate punches, and he knows how to stay in the pocket. He doesn't get rattled, he doesn't get shaken, he's got an excellent chin, he's got tremendous heart, and a wealth of mixed martial arts experience. He is no joke, he was no one's fool, and he's a dangerous threat to anyone in the heavyweight division, especially if he comes in in shape and motivated, which he certainly will be this evening. 
All right, well, two big men get set to throw down oh, I in can't a wait. big way tonight. We are about to see the main event here at UFC 55 Fury. Let's check out some other predictions. It's going to be a great fight. Uh, or Arlovsky and uh, Bunatelli are going to do what I like to like to see. They're going to stand up and pound each other until one of them falls down. So that'll be good. It'll be fun. Uh, we got Arlovsky Bunatello for the main event. It's going to be a very tough fight for Bunatello. He's got very heavy hands, very good striker. But Arlovsky's been so dominant. He's been knocking out people that we thought had concrete blocks for heads. It's going to be very tough to stand with him. And Bunatello has always been a little bit weak in the cardio area. So my pick's got to be Arlovsky. In the main event, I'm going to have to go with uh, Buenatello. I train with him. He's got quick hands. They hit hard. He's, he's, a good, he's a good fighter. I'm going for Buenatello. It's hard to say. Both guys are heavy hitters. But I think uh, Arlovsky got more chance to win. I'm leaning a little bit more towards Arlovsky. But if Buenatello wins, don't be surprised. I like Buenatello. I'd like to see him win this fight. But uh, I think that Arlovsky is a little too athletic for him. He's on a roll right now. And um, I, don't, I don't see it going Buenatello's way. Along the same lines, uh, Bonatello has a puncher's chance. He's got some great power in his hands, but uh, Arlovsky's at the top of his game right now. He moves well on his feet, and he's, he's a hard guy to hit. So, I mean, um, I, see, uh, I see Arlovsky having a lot more outs and ways to win this fight than Bonatello. I'd love to see Bonatello win, but I just don't think he's got what it takes to beat Arlovsky. Arlovsky's on a great roll. He's a heck of an athlete. Does a great job not getting hit, so I, I think is going to uh, knock Bonatello out. And then hopefully I'll get to kick uh, Arlovsky's ass, of course. Bonatello has a puncher's chance in this fight, but Orlovsky is too big an athlete for him. I think it's going to be Orlovsky's night tonight. We've just heard from the best the UFC has to offer, and this is it. The moment we have all been waiting for. Two titans take to the octagon, ready to stand toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Oh yeah, there he is, Joe, Paul Buentello, and you said it best, no one should take this man lightly. Absolutely, I mean, he has, a, you know, a puncher's chance, you would say, because his punches are excellent. I mean, it's not just a puncher's chance, he's a very skilled athlete. He's got very pinpoint, accurate punches. I mean, he, he stays in the pocket, he stays calm under fire, he doesn't get rattled. When, when other guys are moving away and making mistakes and leaving their head up and backing out of punches, he stays in tight with his hands up and delivers sharp, accurate, short punches. I mean, we saw that against Justin Eilers. Eilers came in swinging. Guentello blocked all of it and just landed devastating shot after devastating shot, eventually putting Justin Eilers away. He comes from an excellent camp, American Kickboxing Academy. I mean, Dave Camarillo, Crazy Bob Cook, Javier Mendez. It's an excellent camp. There's so many good guys up there. Mike Swick and, uh, you know, Mike Kyle. It's just, it's just a, it's a huge camp filled with great guys. Josh Thompson's up there. And, you know, whenever you're in a camp like that, everybody just feeds off each other. There's so many guys building on top of each other. It's just like a snowball effect. And Paul Blantel, well, Paul Blantel is the premier heavyweight in that camp. Wentello absolutely considers himself the number one contender. He expects to be here. He, of all people, though, wants to prove to himself that he can do it against the dangerous Andre Arlovsky. Few more moments until the champion gets set to walk in. The crowd is finally treated to the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world, the UFC belt high in the air. Andre Arlovsky comes from Minsk, makes his home now, Joe, in Chicago, Illinois. Andre Arlovsky is a, an enormous man who moves like a small man. He's 240 pounds, and he moves like a guy who's 160 pounds. He's really a specimen. I mean, beautiful striker. He, he's got just really smooth, accurate combinations, great leg kicks, great punches, and he proved against Tim Sylvia. He's got great submissions to go with that. He's a true mixed martial arts fighter where he'll, he'll figure out what to do in a given situation. When he tagged 
Tim Sylvia, and Tim Sylvia went down. He didn't flail on him. He immediately saw an opening, grabbed a hold of an ankle, and finished Tim Sylvia with a leg lock. And he said he will do the same thing to Paul Buentello if Buentello leaves a leg out there. That is he, what he believes is his submission specialty, it's leg locks. He is just coming into his own now at 26 years of age. He is the premier UFC heavyweight champion. He won the title because the UFC heavyweight champion, Frank Mir, was in a, a motorcycle accident, was badly injured, was forced to vacate the title. Arlovsky won the interim title, and then when it was deemed that Mir could no longer compete, and he needed much more time, they gave Arlovsky the heavyweight title when he fought Tim Sylvia. Let's take a look at the tail of the tape brought to you by Science. Science Extreme Supplements available at GNC stores nationwide. Wintello with a little bit more experience. Arlovsky with an inch height advantage and their reach, Joe, exactly the same. Let's send it in once again to the veteran voice of the Octagon, Bruce Buffer. Ladies and gentlemen, this UFC championship bout is sanctioned by the Mohegan Tribe Department of Athletic Regulations with Chairman Bruce Bosom. Our three judges at Octagon side are Cecil Peoples, Jeff Mullen, and Abe Bellardo. And our Octagon side physician in charge is Dr. Schwartz. When the action begins, our referee in charge of the Octagon for this contest is Big John McCarthy. This event is sponsored by Zions Extreme Supplements. And now, live from the sold out arena here at the Mohegan Sun, it's time! This fight is five rounds for the undisputed UFC Heavyweight Championship of the World! Introducing first, the challenger standing in the blue corner. He is a boxer and a jiu-jitsu fighter. He holds a professional mixed martial arts record of 19 wins with eight losses. Standing six feet two inches tall, he weighed in at 251 pounds. Fighting out of San Jose, California, introducing Paul the Head Hunter. Introducing the champion, standing in the red corner. This UFC warrior is a kickboxer and a sambo fighter. He holds a professional mixed martial arts record of 10 wins with three losses. Standing six feet three inches tall, he weighed in at 236 pounds. Fighting out of Chicago, Illinois, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Instructions in your dressing rooms. Do I have any questions from the challenger? Any questions from the champion? Fight clean, fight hard, fight fair. Touch gloves, go back to your corners. All right, here we go. Here we go indeed. We welcome Octagon side with us once again, Eddie Bravo, to help us score this fight. Arlovsky has what Wentello wants the title, the belt, and we begin. Wentello's his idea is to check Arlovsky's kicks and get in there with punches. Arlovsky takes him down. What happened? What happened? Big John right away. Wow. It's over That's already. It. Unbelievable. That is it. You know what? We were blocked. We didn't even see the punch at the end of the fight. Andre Arlovsky. Arm wow. in the air. Paul Wentello can't even believe it. And Joe, you can see his world is rocked at the moment. Wow. That was so fast. And we, we were from an egg, we didn't even see the punch land. Well, much quicker than we expected. Wow. Keeping in mind some of the best finishes in under 38 seconds. Don Fry won in eight seconds back in UFC 8. Oleg Taktarov won in six seconds, excuse me, in nine seconds back in UFC 6. Let's, but, 
I'm sorry. Joe, look at this. Let's hit. take a look at the replay. This is the, the right hand that stopped the fight. I mean, we didn't even see this. Right on the chin. You know, people are yelling out bullshit, but there's no bullshit in that right hand. Here it is. What a great job oh, by the big the John chin. McCarthy. Look at this. Bam, on the button, one punch knockout. Paul Buentello clearly was out of it. His legs were stiff, and he was gone. What that it? was it. Wow, anticlimactic, but very climactic at the same time. This is what makes the UFC the high-class organization that it is. You've got employees like Big John McCarthy who see everything, and certainly he saw what happened, the right decision. The crowd may not like it, but that is the way it's going to be. Let's go inside to the veteran voice of the Octagon, Bruce Buffer. Ladies and gentlemen, referee John McCarthy has called a stop to this contest at 15 seconds of round number one. For the winner, and still the undisputed UFC heavyweight champion of the world, the Pitbull, Andre Olowski. All right, Andre, congratulations. Uh, a lot of people were booing because they didn't see the punch land. We didn't even see it land. It was so fast at ringside. Now, a one-punch knockout, you, you, you've gotten rid of almost every challenger in front of you. What do you want to do now? No, uh, it's up to you. See, I'm a fighter. I'm ready for anybody, for any time. I'm a fighter, it's my way. All right, now, you won the title when Frank Mir was unable to defend the title and he had to be stripped. Does that bother you? Would you like to face him now? Of course, I want to fight against Frank Mir because a few months ago, our fight was canceled. Right now, I want to fight against Frank Mir. All right, now, Andre, you're clearly at the top of the heap now in the Ultimate Fighting Championship. What, what, what keeps you going? What challenges you now? One, I, can't, I need help translating. Okay, let's, let's just look at the punch. Talk us through this. Did you see this coming? This is the punch that ended the fight. No, I was a little surprised because Paul was so aggressive. I've trained hard in a boxing gym with my boxing coach, Mike Garcia, with my jiu-jitsu trainer, uh, Dina Castellas, my fitness trainer, Oleg Danilov, Val Polarnichka. I train hard, you know, I train th three times a day. It's my way. I'm ready for fight. All right, well, Andre, congratulations on another devastating performance. You get better every time out, and we really look forward to seeing you again. UFC heavyweight champion Andre Orlovsky, ladies and gentlemen. Very quick, uh, I want to tell, thank you all my, all my sponsors, all my friends who support me. Uh, guys, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Of course, my team, Leo, uh, Alexi, Dino, Michael, Spencer Dilla. I appreciate my boxing uh, partner, uh, Carl Divas. All my guys support me from Chicago. Thank you so much. UFC, great sport. Uh, great crowd here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Joe, the more times you see it, the more unbelievably undeniable it is that Big John McCarthy made the right call. Paul Buentello just fell over with that shot to the chin. Andre Arlovsky retains his UFC championship belt. He is the heavyweight at the top of the pecking order. Everyone must come to him. And Joe, as we get set to wrap things up, time now to take a look at the submission of the night brought to you by Tap Out. The submission of the night this evening goes to Hanato Babalu Sabral with a beautiful triangle that he got on Chael Sonnen. I mean, uh, Hanato just continues to grow and evolve. He got a beautiful triangle armbar combination showing he is deadly off his back as well as on top. Fantastic technique, beautiful job by Hinato. Congratulations for the tap out of the night.
And Joe, you said it earlier, if you are a fan of fighting, UFC 55 Fury had something for everybody, didn't it? There was some great fights, fantastic. Andre Arlovsky showed why he, why he is a UFC heavyweight champion with a beautiful right hand knockout of Paul Buentello. We saw some fantastic fights all evening. Jorge Rivera dominant over Dennis Hallman, Marcio Cruz choking out Kunihara. It was some fantastic fights tonight. It has been quite an evening here at the Mohegan Sun Resort and Casino inside the Mohegan Sun Arena. And wow, it was game on. The fights were fast and furious. Sakara and Faircloth, Kunihara and Pei Depano. Of course, you had Jorge Rivera and Dennis Hallman as well as the incomparable Joe Riggs winning over Chris Lytle. Everybody got their licks in, and it was well-deserved. The winners go home champions. Elvis Sinisek would fall to Forrest Griffin, and it would be Bob Alou Sobral who would win right there over Chael Sonnen. Sonnen would put up a fight, but it would be Bob Alou who would finally take it home and win his shot at redemption. The fan favorite once again, Forrest Griffin took to the octagon and early on, Elvis Sinisic stood toe to toe, but Forrest Griffin was the one smiling at the finish. And then our big guys got in the octagon. Brandon Lee Hinkle against Sean Gannon. He would leave Brandon Lee Hinklewood with his arms raised. And then of course the main event, Arlowski versus Gwen Tello. In the seventh fastest finish in UFC history, it would be Andre Arlovsky keeping his undisputed heavyweight title. For everyone here at Zufa, I am Craig Hummer. So long.